Honourable Members, the President. Members, are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice of which some has been given is the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. Uh, I refer to the registration and compliance of wastewater treatment systems. I sound very loud today. Um, in Western Australia, and charge changes in this industry for secondary treatment standards for wastewater. But I ask one, are Western Australian businesses wanting to install secondary wastewater treatment systems expected to be certified as compliant or certified to AS 1546.7.2 Two, if yes to one, can they access testing for that compliance in Western Australia? Three, if no to two, are border closures Im impacting on their ability to access testing elsewhere? And four, if so, will the government now assist with the process to ensure WA businesses are not closed due to the impact of no testing facilities in WA and the border closures from COVID-19? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following answers provided. Uh, I'm not sure on, which, on behalf, behalf of which minister it doesn't say, but anyway, I'm providing it. Um, one, uh, Western Australian businesses are required to comply with the stated Australian standards when installing secondary wastewater treatment systems. AS 1546.7 2017 does not exist. Two to three, not applicable. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Energy. Uh, I refer to the financial years 2016, uh, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, and 2021, and I ask one, for each financial year, how many residential rooftop solar systems have been installed in Western Australia? And two, for each financial year, what is the total amount of energy purchased through the Renewable Energy Buyback Scheme? It's uh, 499. Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the uh, member for the question, and the uh, following information has been provided to me by the Minister uh, for Energy. Uh, now, this is substantially in tabular form, out, um, uh, outlining the number of uh, rooftop solar installations and outlining the total amount of energy. Um, uh, purchased through those, that scheme, uh, and uh, it's in tabular form, so I'm going to seek leave. to have that incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave's granted. Yep. Uh, the Honourable Colin de Grasse. Uh, thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to the Quarantine Advisory Panel, QAP, the 10-member advisory panel appointed on 27 May 2021 to oversee hotel quarantine in WA and the advice received from the Minister for Health in response to questions 377 and 378 asked by the Honourable Mia Davies MLA yesterday in the other place. And I ask one, how many times has the QAP met, detailing for each meeting, a, the dates they met at least once, b, whether quorum was achieved or not, c, the number of conflicts of interest recorded, and d, whether external advisers or observers attended and who those individuals were, two, how many times has the QAP provided concurrent advice to the Minister for Health, or the Chief Executive Officer and the form in which that advice was provided. Three, are communiques and minutes of the QAP meetings publicly available? If, if yes, where can these be located? If these documents are not publicly available, will the Premier please table these documents? Leader of the House. For some notice of the question. Uh, one, a 14th of June 2021 and the 27th of July 2021. B, yes, both meetings. C, nil both meetings. D, nil both meetings. Two, as stated in section 4.5 of the Quarantine Advisory Panel Terms of Reference, Legislative Assembly tabled paper number 256, the QAP may, in limited circumstances and if considered necessary and appropriate, provide concurrent advice to the Chief Executive Officer of the Department of Health and the Minister for Health. Three, I table the attached minutes of the QAP meeting on 14 June 21, which have been finalised. Uh, the Honourable Yorn Sibma. Some notices given is to the Minister for Mental Health, uh, representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to the Minister's media statement confirming that the government has entered into a $23 million contract to build the Environment Online Approvals Portal, and I ask one, noting that the government has promised the development of Environment Online for years and funded the program in the 2020-21 budget. 
Why has it taken the government this long to appoint a contractor? Two, noting that the last budget funded the Environment Online project to a level of $28 million, what has happened to the residual $5 million? Uh, three, is it correct to interpret the Minister's statement as confirming that the project will not be fully functional until the 2023-24 financial year, as opposed to the 2022-23 target date referred to in last year's budget? And four, what level of functionality is anticipated per each development phase of the Environment and Line project until the project is completed? Uh, those documents tabled, uh, provided by the Leader of the House are tabled. The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, Environment Online is a significant investment that required detailed planning and evaluation of potential contractors via proc procurement process overseen by the Department of Finance. A request for tender was issued in October 2020. And the evaluations of proposals involved testing the performance of the preferred respondent via a capability pilot project. The contract was awarded on successful completion of that pilot. Two, $23 million represents the value of the contract for the system integrator or build partner for Environment Online. A separate contract valued at $4.5 million was awarded on 31 March 2021 for program management services. Three to four, Environment Online is designed to be delivered in seven distinct phases over the next three years, with additional functionality available at the conclusion of each phase. Each phase will, will deliver full functionality for the relevant regulatory activities as outlined below. Phase one, environmental impact assessment. Phase two, industry regulation. Phase three, native vegetation regulation and offsets. Phase four, incidents and, and investigations. Phase five, waste regulation. Phase six, contaminated sites regulation. And phase seven, water regulation. The Honourable Nick Guerin. About notice of which some notice has been given us to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Minister for Health. I refer to your answer to my question on notice number 151 and to the MNS reference group. And I ask, one, what reason did the group give the Chief Health Officer for the recommended changes to the Form 2? Two, on what date and in what form was that recommendation made? Three, is the group's recommendation and reasons contained in any written document? And four, if yes to three, will you table those documents? Minister for Mental Health. <coughs> Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. I have been advised by the Department of Health that further time is required to answer this question. The information will, will be provided to the honourable member by the 17th of August 2021. The honourable Donna Farragher. Mr. President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the redeployment of school health nurses to COVID-19 vaccination clinics, and I ask one, how many schools have had their access to school health nurses reduced as a result of this redeployment? Two, have school health nurses been redeployed on a voluntary basis, and if not, what was the selection process? And three, have any child health nurses been redeployed to COVID-19 vaccination clinics, and if so, how many? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to three. The Department of Health has, rec has requested the Department of Education to assist with the COVID-19 vaccination program. The COVID-19 vaccination program is an important priority for the health and safety of all Western Australians. Therefore, all efforts need to be made to ensure the vaccination program continues to build momentum so we get as many Western Australians vaccinated as quickly as possible. I can advise that some school nurses will assist the COVID-19 vaccination blitz, and the Department of Education has advised there will be minimal impact and these changes present no risk to student safety. The Honourable Peter Collier. When you're ready. I am now. Thank you, President. My question without notice, which some is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the establishment of the Bikey Task Force Operation Seagrass in September 2018. I ask one, how many personnel were employed when Operation Seagrass was established? And two, how many personnel were employed in Operation Seagrass on July 1, 2019, 2020, and 2021? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of this question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to two, the Western Australian Police, I should say Police Force, advise. As this operation concluded in early 2020, the number of personnel attached to the operation can be provided and was 35 personnel with resources from other police units used on an as-needs basis. The Hon. Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. My question without notice, which some has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Commerce, C455. I refer to the review of the Residential Tenancies Act 1987 that commenced in 2019, of which the consultation period ended June 30, 2020. And I ask, will the Minister please provide an update on the progress of the review? Uh, specifically, 
When is the review expected to be completed? When will the results from the review be released? And when can we expect to see the subsequent legislation introduced? Thank you. Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question, and the uh, Minister for Commerce has provided the following information. A, the review is current. The consultation phase has concluded, and outcomes are expected to be provided to government before the end of 2021. The government expects to be able to inform stakeholders about its response to the review before the end of 2021. Subsequent legislation will be subject to government's legislative priorities. The Honourable Wilson Tucker. President, my question with that notice, in which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer the Premier to the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, dated 9th of August 2021, which found that average temperatures in Australia increased by approximately 1.4 degrees since 1910 and which warns that we are on track for rising sea levels, increased and more intense bushfires, increased droughts and increased floods. I also refer the Premier to his comments in October 2019, in which he said during in, in an interview on 6PR, and I quote, a climate emergency, I don't know what that means. In light of the IPCC's findings, will the Premier finally admit that the state is facing a climate emergency? Uh, the Leader of the House. <coughs> the question. I refer the Honourable Member to the Western Australian Climate Policy, published in 2020, which underscores the State Government's commitment to adapting to climate change and to working with all sectors of the economy to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The Honourable Sophia Melmond. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer the Minister to the uh, ch the child inside in Australia, we prosecute 10-year-olds, prosecute especially if they're black. Published on New Matilda on June 28, 2020 by Warwick Jones, and I ask one, does the minister support legislation in favour of increasing the minimum age of criminal responsibility? And two, does the state government have any plans to increase this beyond 14 years of age? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One, the Attorney General is proud to have placed the question of raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility on the agenda of the former Council of Attorney Generals, CAG. The honourable member may be aware that, due to the Attorney General's advocacy, Western Australia chaired a cross-jurisdictional working group examining this issue on behalf of CAG. Any changes would require resources and, consider and careful consideration to ensure that the small number of children who exhibit serious offending at a young age can be properly managed outside the criminal justice system. The WA government already diverts young people away from the criminal justice system where reasonable to no. The Honourable Brian Walker. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, number C485, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the Kalgoorlie Minor of 9th of August 2021, and in particular to an article entitled Survey Finds Reluctance from GPs on Cannabis. What the national poll actually found was doctors citing cost and the lack of knowledge on their own part as the main reasons for not prescribing medicinal cannabis. Acknowledging that cost is intrinsically linked to the PBS and our federal colleagues, I ask. One, what, if anything, is the McGowan government in general and the health department in particular doing to educate GPs on the availability and application of medical cannabis? And two, will the minister push for more formalised training on medicinal cannabis to be made available to doctors both during their university training and beyond. Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. One, comprehensive information on access to medicinal cannabis products is published by the National Medicines Regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. This includes detailed evidence-based clinical guidelines, information and resources for prescribing doctors. The Western Australian Department of Health, DOH, uh, assisted in the development of these guidelines. The National Prescribing Service also has a range of resources for patients and health practitioners. The DOH endorses and provides links to these resources in online materials related to medicinal cannabis. Two, no, the inclusion and coverage of specific aspects of therapeutic management of diseases in accredited university training qualifications for registered health practitioners are a matter for the respective individual education institutions to consider. 
The Hon. James Haywood. Thank you, President. My question, uh, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Housing First Homelessness Initiative, and I ask one, please provide a breakdown of the $270,000 uh, spent up to 4 August 2021, specifically how much is spent on administration, staffing and direct assistance for homeless people. Two, how many people has Housing First Initiative helped to find accommodation, resulting in those people no longer being uh, homeless? Three, considering the lack of available social housing in the short to medium term, will the minister consider an interim options for homeless people in Bunbury to provide a safe and protected space for rough sleeping? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Disability Services. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided by the Minister for Community Services. One, the communities provides funding to organisations for delivery of services. Funding provided to services providers is not broken down into administration, staffing and direct assistance. Two, the contracted services continue to work with the identified cohort under the Housing First Homelessness Initiative. I commit to provide to the parliament with an update in results before November 2021. Three, Communities is supportive of funded Housing First support services using temporary and transitional accommodation options with wraparound supports to house clients to help them to get their lives back on track while longer term accommodation is being sourced. Uh, the Honourable uh, Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. My question without notice, for some, which, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the practice of transferring foreign seafarers from ship to shore and on to outbound aircraft in Port Hedland at the National Airport and I ask, how is the minister confident that all seafarers have undertaken their mandatory two weeks uh, isolation aboard their ships prior to the transfer, B, uh, that the same personnel are aboard the vessels throughout the 14-day period, C, that all seafarers are COVID tested and that the results are provided to those managing the transfer prior to transfer? And D, that the procedures such as mandatory mask wearing, the separation of all seafarers from the community are being managed in accordance with requirements during the transfer through the community of Port Hedland. And finally, given the concerns of the community of Port Hedland, the prior history of prior breaches, will the minister consider establishing a transparent and publicly available reporting mechanism that outlines details on the movement of seafarers from ship to shore, including their times for transfer destinations within WA and the performance indicators on any breaches in procedures and protocols? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. 1A. WA Health adopts a universal precautions approach, whereby strict precautions are taken for all dealings with and for all movement of seafarers disembarking from international vessels. It is not a WA Health requirement for international seafarers to undertake a two-week quarantine period on board the vessel prior to transfer off the vessel, and this would not guarantee that there is not a COVID-19 outbreak on board the vessel. There are instead legal directions in place that specify restrictions for international crew and mitigation activities for the workers that may be exposed to any international crew. The maritime crew member directions stipulate requirements to mitigate COVID-19 risk of crew members disembarking a vessel. These directions include the requirement that all off-signing international seafarers be transported by dedicated conveyances, including a dedicated charter flight from Port Hedland to Perth, and enter a state quarantine, quarantine facility unless they are able to board an international flight to their home destination within eight hours. 1B, not applicable. 1C, seafarers are not required to be tested prior to disembarkation if the vessel has been granted pratique and the crew on board are well. Testing prior to disembarkation only occurs at the request of WA Health if Ill illness on board the vessel is suspected. If this occurs, results are made known urgently to WA Health, who manage the movements of the seafarers concerned. 1D. The maritime crew member directions and the transport and accommodation services exposed maritime worker directions stipulate the restrictions placed on seafarers from international vessels, including during their transit through the community. Mask wearing by the international seafarers is mandatory, as are other requirements, including that they occupy a dedicated waiting area at airports. WA Health work closely with key stakeholders, including the Port Authority, shipping agents and WA Police, to ensure the requirements of transfer of seafarers are understood and met. WA Police are responsible for ensuring compliance with the maritime crew member directions and the transport and accommodation services exposed maritime worker directions. Two, the movement of seafarers is controlled by the Emergency Management Act, 
uh, directions and overseen by WA Police, which provides individual directions to seafarers disembarking a vessel. Any breaches to, pro to protocols are followed up by WA Police and WA Health, and the individuals involved are managed. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, President. Notice which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Police. Uh, I refer to the Police Air Wing, and specifically in relation to the three planes. I hope I get the pronunciation right. Pilatus PC12, registration VHWPY, Pilatus PC12, registration VHWPQ, and Gippsland Air Van, registration VHWPF. I'd ask one, when was each plane last flown? Two, is each plane currently ready for use? Three, if noted two, which planes are not currently ready for use and why not? And four, if noted two, when will those currently unready planes be ready for service? Minister for Mental Health. Uh, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australian Police Force has access to additional air support, including on a contracted basis, as well as the three planes referred to by the Honourable Member and advisers. One, A, 15 May 2021, B, 11 August 2021, C, 18 June 2021. 2A, no. 2B, yes. 2C, no. 3A, undergoing, uh, undergoing 24 month service and inspection and repaint. Uh, B, not applicable. C, currently used for pilot and crew training only. 4A, scheduled for week commencing 30 August 2021. B, not applicable. C, scheduled for week commencing 16 August 2021. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. Thank you, President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Agriculture. I refer to your government's announcement to fast track the recruitment of nurses from overseas and interstate, including increasing the entry cap for people entering the state to quarantine and paying for these expenses. And I ask, will the government offer similar support packages for other sectors desperately in need of workers, including the agricultural sector, which is predicting the state's largest ever grain harvest? The, the, the Honourable the Minister for Regional Development. Thank you. I uh, thank the member for the question. Uh, and uh, as the member is uh, probably well aware uh, that we are actively running the seasonal worker uh, program in this state and that we currently have uh, 1,400 uh, seasonal workers that we, um, through our state government uh, unit, uh, have, uh, have supported coming into, uh, into the state. And we have uh, two planes a month uh, that are booked um, between now and the end of the year, subject to there being uh, the demand by growers. So uh, by the end of, uh, of this year, we would be looking at having uh, something in the order of 2,000 uh, seasonal workers who stay outside of our cap so that they are not included in that cap. So that has been a program that we have actively um, supported um, and, uh, and driven in this, uh, in this state. Now, um, uh, we are, many of those workers, of course, are not experienced in grain harvest. There's not a lot of broad acre in Vanuatu or Tonga. Um, but we do note that a lot of the backpackers that are traditionally used aren't also uh, necessarily experienced. Now, in addition to that work, and we are trying to bring, um, uh, we are working very closely with people like Mick Fells from uh, the Grains Division of WAF uh, to uh, connect up with these workers from Vanuatu. And we had a meeting with a group of farmers today at Mininu about exactly the, the same issue, how we could bring out a group into that area. Um, in addition uh, to that, we have put a proposition uh, to Minister Littleprout. Um, the Federal Minister, we've put a proposition uh, about bringing somewhere between 300 and 900 uh, grain harvest workers in from Northern Europe. We're putting, we have uh, calculated how this would work, what the cost would be, um, and we are asking them to open facilities for fully vaccinated uh, Northern Europeans uh, to come in uh, to help the deliver that um, that grain harvest. I would very, you know, we know that hotel quarantine is absolutely. Um, at its max, uh, and we think that the use of Commonwealth facilities, including those on Christmas Island, would be a, um, a practical outcome. And we've done the costings, and we think uh, that it can be made to work. We've sent that off to Minister Littleprout, and we would encourage 
the opposition to use its good offices uh, with uh, the federal government to get them on board and helping us meet this situation. The Honourable Nick, uh, sorry. The Honourable Yorn Sibmer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, President, my question, uh, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. It's a question from yesterday. Uh, C481 is the reference. I refer to your April 14 media statement, uh, quote, important staffing boost for WA hospitals, end quote, which outlined plans to launch an advertising campaign and a national and international recruitment drive to fill nursing positions. And I ask one, when will the campaign start and for how long will it run? Two, how much will be spent on the overall campaign and what is the breakdown of spend through the following channels? A, television, B, radio, C, print, D, social media and E, other avenues. Three, which state and countries will the states and countries will the advertising be focused on? Four, has the campaign, if it has started, resulted in any new permanent contracts? And five, if yes to question four above, how many? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is uh, answered on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, I have an advisor further time is required to answer this question. The information will be provided to the honourable member by tomorrow, the 12th of August 2021. The Honourable Nick Goran. And without notice, is to the Minister for Industrial Relations. I refer to your announcement today that public submissions can be made on a draft workers' compensation bill, and I ask, will the submissions be made public? <laughs> The Minister for Mental Health. Uh, thanks very much, uh, President, and I thank the honourable member for the question. He is indeed correct. I did issue a uh, draft. I, I did issue a press release today uh, relating to a draft bill to modernise workers' compensation laws. This is, of course, uh, me uh, acting uh, and delivering on the 2021 election commitment that was made uh, to pr progress a bill that will modernise workers' compensation laws in Western Australia. Public, public submissions are now open uh, for a three-month period, and they close at the end. Uh, they close the end on November the 10th this year. In relation to the submissions that, that have been uh, that will that will be received as part of that process, uh, no decision has been made on whether they will be released at this stage. Uh, I'm happy. I, I take it by by the honourable member asking the question that he has an interest in those submissions being publicly uh, released. So I'm happy to take that issue on notice and consider it. The honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, notice which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the state government's COVID-19 vaccination program, and I ask, number one, what is the current stock level of Pfizer first-dose vaccinations for each health region? Number two, what is the current stock level of AstraZeneca first-dose vaccinations for each health region? And number three, what is the rationale for the distribution of Pfizer stock across the state? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister of Health. One to three, the Commonwealth Government allocates and distributes vaccines to the states and to primary health care providers, sorry, primary care providers, and the planning parameters for the allocation have not been shared with the state. The vaccine stocks provided to WA Health are managed centrally and provided to regional areas as required. As at 10 August 2021, the Pfizer stock on hand for WA Health was 100,794 doses, and the AstraZeneca stock on hand for WA Health was 51,913 doses. Uh, the Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you very much, President. My question, uh, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to driving uh, assessment availability, and I ask how many driving assessment cancellations occurred in Bunbury during the period from the 29th of June to the 21st, uh, to the uh, sorry, from the 29th of June 2021 to the 4th of July 2021, inclusive. What's the current pass/fail rate for drivers uh, tested at each of the test locations in the state? Uh, three, how many of the following has the Minister's office received in community members expressing concern about the driving test uh, system uh, failure rate since June 1, 2021? Physical letters, emails and phone calls. Thank you. Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. 141 across the South West. Two, current pass fail rates are in line with the figures provided to the member in response to Legislative Council question without notice 262. Three, this information is not able to be provided in the time frame requested, and as such, the member is asked to place this part of the question on notice. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. 
Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Small Business. I refer to the COVID-19 Small Business Lockdown Assistant Grant and businesses that are currently ineligible to apply for those grants. And I ask one, how many pieces of correspondence has the Minister received relating to small and medium enterprises missing out on COVID-19 support grants? Two, is the Minister considering broadening the COVID-19 support grants to businesses currently inel ineligible, such as allied health professionals, boutique clothing stores, tavern owners, wine door seller operations and printing companies? Three, what action is the Minister taking to ensure that SMEs such as those in two don't fall through the cracks and end up missing out on COVID support? Four, given the likelihood of an extended hard border with the eastern states, has the Minister considered long-term solutions to this issue, such as codes of conduct, policies or regulations? Five, if yes to four, what are these and have they been discussed with the industry bodies or ministers such as the Minister for Commerce? If yes, please detail. Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President. And I provide the following response on behalf of the Minister for Small Business. One, the Minister received 45 pieces of correspondence related to small and medium enterprises whose applications did not meet the eligibility for COVID-19 support grants. Two, the McGowan government's $3,000 Small Business Lockdown Assistant Grants program is a dedicated program designed to deliver a once-off cash flow assistance uh, to small businesses operating in sectors most impacted by the restrictions. The program is in addition to the more than $1.3 billion of COVID-19 assistance the McGowan government has provided to West Australian businesses, which has included electro le electricity bill relief, payroll tax and business licence fee waivers, grants and other industry-specific measures. For the members' benefit, taverns are eligible for the assistance grant. Three, the state government's strong approach to COVID-19 has enabled WA to return to pre-lockdown life quickly without the need for venue and crowd limits, mask wearing or other disruptions to small businesses. As we've experienced in WA, necessary short circuit breaking lockdowns allow, a small business, allow small businesses to return to normal trade as quickly as possible. Four to five, it is unclear what the member is referring to with these questions. The member is respectfully requested to rephrase them. The Leader of the House. Jim? The business of the House is resumed. Are there any further President. answers? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Peter Collier's question without notice 446, asked yesterday, which I seek leave to have incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave's granted. Thank you. And President, pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I wish to inform the House that the question that the answer to question on notice number 153, asked by the Honourable Brad Pettit, MLC to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment, will be provided tomorrow, the 12th of August 2021. Any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Uh, members, we return to orders of the day. Uh, order number 24, Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, and we are in committee.